Hi, everybody. We're going to get started. It's nice to see you all. Can everyone hear me okay? Louder? All right. How's that? Okay. Um, welcome to this evening's lecture in the 2023 Follow the River Lecture Series. This is the final 2023 <laughs> lecture. Um, this event is hosted by the Hudson River Maritime Museum and sponsored by Rondout Savings Bank. I am Carrie Gallagher, the Director of Education at the museum. I am with Erin Boss, who is a Education Program Manager. She's monitoring the Zoom from the back of the room. And Leslie Drojak, who signed you in, is our incredible volunteer at the museum. Um, <clears throat> so before we begin, can I please ask you to turn off your cell phones? Thank you. Um, some logistical information. The restrooms are out that hallway and on your right. Emergency exit is straight back. So if you hear bells or anything like that, we're going to go right to the back of the room in an orderly fashion. <laughs> um, there's also water, coffee, and some snacks on the table. I would like to let you know that the Maritime Museum is a 501c3 not-for-profit. We don't receive funds from the city, the state, or the federal government, except for some periodic project-based grants. We thank Rondout Savings Bank for their sponsorship of the lecture series. We also thank you for your contributions that help support the museum. We hope that you are already on our email list and receive information about upcoming programs at the museum. If not, please add your email address to the sign-up sheet with Leslie in the back. Um, some housekeeping for our friends on Zoom. Please mute yourself and stay muted for the duration of the lecture. We're recording this presentation to upload later onto our YouTube channel. And if you are not muted, you'll also be recorded <laughs> with the presentation. Um, Please ask any questions using the chat function at the conclusion of the talk. We will indicate um, when the chat is open for questions. Uh, we'll leave time at the end of the presentation for answering questions, both from you guys here in the room and our friends on Zoom. <clears throat> we also include the following acknowledgement in our public programming. This is a water acknowledgement statement. The Hudson River Maritime Museum is located on Rondout Creek, part of Lenapahoki, the traditional home of the Lenape people. We recognize the painful history of forced removal, disp dispossession, cultural suppression, and genocide of the indigenous peoples. By collaborating with present-day Lenape communities, culture bearers, and scholars, we are actively working to improve our exhibits, public programs, and educational resources, mm -hmm. and help everyone better understand this important part of history. Thank you. Our next lecture is scheduled for March 13th here at the Wooden Boat School. The lecture is titled Ladies of the Valley, Women of the Hudson Valley's Great Estates. It is written by Mary Mistler. This is her first um, published work. She is a, was a was and I think still is a docent at a lot of the great estates along the Hudson River, and she compiled information. And during COVID, she wrote this really great book. So we're going to be really happy to have her come during Women's History Month to speak to us about the women of the great estates. This evening's lecture is "Bricks and Brick Ruins of the Hudson Valley," presented by Thomas Rinaldi and Robert Yastinisak. Um, Thomas grew up near Poughkeepsie, New York. He's the author of Patented 1000 Design Patents and New York Neon. His photographs have been published in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Post, the New York Observer, Westchester Magazine, CNN Online, and elsewhere. He currently works as an architectural designer in New York City. Robert Yastinsack has been documenting historic and distinctive architecture in the Hudson Valley since 1994. His photographs have appeared in the New York Times, the Journal News, Preservation Magazine, Talkinian Magazine, and other publications. Rob's first book, Briarcliff Lodge, 
was published in 2004 by Arcadia as part of its Images in America series. He is a lifelong resident of Westchester County. Tom and Rob are co-authors of the book, Hudson Valley Ruins, Forgotten Landmarks of an American Landscape. Their photographs have been exhibited at the New York State Museum at Albany and at the Municipal Art Society of New York. This book will be for sale at the end of the lecture at a table in the back. And um, Rob and Tom will also be signing the books. Um, we're really happy to have them here with us. I'm really happy to see so many people in the Wooden Boat School. Thanks for coming out. And I'm going to turn the podium over to Tom and Rob. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. Thanks to the museum for having us. Um, as Carrie said, this, uh, she mentioned the book that Rob and I co-wrote, which is this book, Hudson Valley Ruins, which came out already quite a few years ago. Um, and the book looks at um, all variety of uh, sites in the Hudson Valley between New York and Albany. What they have in common is that um, they were threatened by neglect and abandonment, but there were mansions and there were churches and there were train stations and there were all different kinds of buildings and all sorts of industrial sites, uh, and of course, brickyards. And the brickyards were, uh, you know, we kept sort of coming back to them as uh, one of the sort of types of sites that we were uh, most interested in. Um, they had, oops, what am I not doing right? <laughs> Trying to go to the next slide here. There we go. There's the cover of the book. All right. <laughs> I think we're in business. Oops. There we go. Uh, so yes, th uh, this is uh, one of Rob's photos of a uh, brickyard that will be familiar probably to a lot of people in the room here. This is a site that's very close to us here. Just, I mean, I don't think it's even a mile away from us. Uh, the Hutton Brickyard as we found it. When was this picture taken, yeah, Rob? 2004. Probably about 2004. It looks a little different now, but it's still there. And we'll kind of come back and talk a little bit about uh, the Hutton Brickyard a little later in the talk. Uh, tonight's talk is not so much a history of uh, brick making in the Hudson Valley or a uh, history of any particular brickyard or of the brickyards generally. Uh, we'll have a little bit of a historical overview, but it's more kind of just a Robin and my take on uh, the brickyards that we encountered in the course of seeking out these uh, different buildings that we photographed, uh, buildings and sites that we photographed for um, the book. And the brickyards were sort of really interesting to us in this kind of like meta level in that, you know, these were the places where the bricks that actually, you know, were used to build many of the buildings that we were photographing were, were made. So, I mean, you know, they were uh, particularly interesting as sites, uh, you know, they were themselves kind of interesting for in their own right, but also uh, interesting because these are the sites that gave rise to all the other sites, uh, many of the other sites. Um, so this is the Hutton Brickyard, um, as looked about 15 years ago. Um, a lot of the information that uh, we'll present tonight came from um, these two books, which you can still get. Uh, I don't know if they're both still in print, but they're still gettable. Uh, of course, the Great Hudson River Brick Industry by George Hutton, Hutton of the Hutton Brickyard uh, here in Kingston, uh, Hutton family prominent in Kingston here. Uh, and the other book uh, by Daniel DeNoyles, uh, Within These Gates, uh, DeNoyles was a, a name that was prominent in the other Hudson River Brick District, which we'll talk about a little later tonight down uh, in Haverstraw, uh, closer to the city in Rockland County. Um, so for this first part, we'll sort of uh, look a little bit about the, the origins and the history of the brick making industry in the Valley, Valley just kind of a quick uh, overview. One of the kind of ironies of the brickyards is that though these were the sites that made the bricks that made, you know, brick buildings, which we sort of, you know, kind of regard as being the, the sturdiest buildings, um, certainly of the 19th and 20th centuries, um, uh, the brickyards themselves very often had uh, very temporary buildings. Their, their own buildings were, were really kind of ephemeral in nature and, and tended to be timber kind of uh, ironically. And so um, we, uh, Rob and I found that uh, brickyard ruins were sort of hard to find. Uh, in the Hudson Valley, and surviving uh, remnants of the brickyards were, uh, were were kind of tricky to to come across. These two pictures are, uh, I think, both showing uh, what was the Schultz Brickyard, uh, also now within walking distance, uh, with the the Empire State Trail uh, opened up from just about right where we are, uh, up towards in East Kingston, maybe three miles north of where we are. Uh, on a nice day, uh, it's not a bad walk from here. Um, 
So the uh, Hudson River brick industry at its height in the uh, early 20th century, right around about 1900, I think there were as many as 135 brickyards uh, noted as having uh, being operated at, at the same time, operating at the same time uh, on the Hudson River. And there were sort of two hot spots of brick uh, making on the Hudson River. Uh, one of them in Westchester and Rockland counties, at the sort of bottom half of this map. Uh, and then the other big center of brick making on the Hudson River was really kind of in the Ulster County shoreline, uh, right about where we are now, and a little bit north of here up into Greene County, uh, into a little bit the southern part of Albany County and Columbia County, uh, too. Uh, as is sort of intuitive, makes sense, the uh, lower part of the, uh, the region is where the brick industry kind of got its start, closer to New York City. Uh, earlier on, uh, the history of brick making in the Hudson Valley goes all the way back to the Dutch colonial period in the 17th century. Uh, in the 19th century, the real uh, center of the industry was in Rockland and uh, Westchester counties. Uh, what happened uh, in a nutshell is they kind of ran out of clay. And so the industry kept moving up further up the river to where there were great available clay deposits, which turned out to be here uh, in Elster County. Um, and in some cases, the brickyard buildings literally were moved up the river, as we'll see a little bit later tonight. Here's a detail map from the George Hutton book uh, showing the uh, density of the brickyards on the Ulster County shoreline here, going from uh, Port Ewan, just below us on the river here, uh, up into Glasgow and Saugerties and Malden, uh, north of us. Here's a bird's eye overview of some of the brickyards in uh, Haverstraw. Um, so we'll kind of uh, look a little bit at uh, what these sites were like. Um, here's a, a fire insurance map of the Schultz Brickyard, which is one of the brickyards we'll see kind of recurring throughout the talk. This is that one that I said uh, you can walk to from here on a, on a nice day, about three miles north of us, up through Sojourner Truth Park uh, on the newly kind of uh, nicely paved um, Empire State Trail. Rob and I started trekking around there before it was paved and so easy to get around. Um, but what this shows is kind of... Um, some of the buildings that we'll sort of walk through in the next slides, uh, the big rectangles along the river, the big uh, red rectangles are the brick kilns. The yellow, um, I believe, is showing us timber structures. So in this case, the kiln shed, uh, as was typical for, for most of the history of the brick industry in the Hudson River, uh, was made out of wood. Um, so there again, that kind of irony of wood buildings for brickyards. Um, the process started in the clay pit, typically, um, which would be sort of just up the river from the brickyard. The clay was uh, excavated um, typically by hand and packed into brick molds, which were typically built out of wood. Um, this is a, a photograph of a horse-powered brick machine from the 1890s um, that was uh, published in George, Hut George Hutton's book. Um, brick molds could be packed by hand, but the real kind of uh, innovation that changed the industry was in about 1851 or 52, uh, a Rockland County uh, Haverstraw area brickmaker called Vervalen developed the brick making machine or the brick machine, which would automatically, it automated that process of packing the wooden brick molds with clay. Uh, and here is a photograph um, of a brick machine in its little brick machine shed, which again is this, it's almost like a lean to structure. So um, it just kind of never ceased to amaze us and sort of frustrate, fr frustrate us too. Um, the kind of, like I said, the really sort of almost temporary character um, of the brick industry buildings. Here is a photograph of the molded bricks being laid out to dry uh, with, I believe, a kiln shed in the background. Uh, again, almost like a lean-to structure. Here's another photograph of that part of the process. Um, the bricks would then be stacked into kilns. Uh, and there's all different kinds of brick kilns. Uh, as many of you, I'm sure, know. But the type of brick kiln that was common here in the Hudson River for most of the history of the uh, Hudson River brick industry was known as the Scove Kiln. And this involved stacking these unfired bricks uh, up into a big structure that almost looked like it could be a, a building of its own with uh, these little firing tunnels that you see the almost Gothic arched openings of, sort of at the bottom of this structure. Um, and so the big scove kiln would be fired with fires lit in these tunnels. Uh, and then uh, it was hugely um, uh, a lot of emissions from this, as you can imagine. Uh, first, this was done with coal. Later in the history of the industry here, it was done, uh, th these kilns would be oil fired. Um, this wound up being sort of the downfall of the industry. Um, but also you wind up with like a lot of 
uh, wasted brick because the brick that was closer to the fire was overcooked. The brick that was farther away from the, the fire was undercooked. Uh, and a lot of that, uh, that surplus brick, as anyone who's ever walked around with any of these Hudson River brick sites knows, was just dumped uh, at the brickyard site. It tended to make pretty good riprap, which is you know, the term for any kind of stone or otherwise that's used to, to stabilize the shoreline. So that was sort of handy for these brickyards because they were shipping a lot of the stuff out by boat. And so they needed a nice sort of stable dock. Uh, and so the, the surplus uh, overcooked or undercooked brick was good for that. Um, but they just wound up kind of dumping it throughout their sites. Uh, and so you go to these brickyard sites now and, and uh, you know, it's fascinating. Anytime a tree falls over, uh, first of all, they can't really get their roots too far into the ground. So the trees tend to, you know, get to a certain size and that's as big as they can get and they fall over. And uh, the roots uh, system that's then turned up on its side, uh, it's just all these bricks kind of tangled up in these roots and they, they sort of, uh, uh, it, you know, it opens up a little area of the ground and, it, you know, uh, so th some of them are, are you know, kind of neat and um, uh, it, it's something that sort of lends, uh, lends itself to uh, brick collecting as a hobby, as we'll see a little bit later too. Here is a photograph, uh, I believe in the, the Hutton Brickyard kiln sheds, the sheds that are still extant today uh, and the last of their kind on the Hudson River, once it was a sort of characteristic uh, building type that you'd see up and down the river, these big kiln sheds. Um, the industry went into decline by the first decades of the 20th century. Uh, and so from 135 brickyards, the numbers just plummeted. Uh, by the 1920s, they were down to, you know, maybe something like in the 20s, the number of brickyards functioning on the Hudson River. Uh, the Depression had an obvious effect. World War II had an obvious effect. And by the 1950s, there were, I think you could count on one hand. Well, maybe maybe there were something like eight or 10 operating by the 1950s. Uh, it dwindled down to two functioning brickyards by the late 1970s, one of which was the Hutton Brickyard here in Kingston. Uh, that closed in 1979, I believe, when the state enacted uh, environmental laws that outlawed uh, belching out all of these emissions that the Scove kilns typically uh, would put out, uh, leaving just one brickyard, which was the Powell and Minnick brickyard in Queemans near Albany, um, which modernized its plant and was using tunnel kilns in the end. That brickyard survived uh, into the era of Rob and I photographing places for uh, this book. And when we first stumbled upon it, it was still actually functioning. When we first started wandering through it, um, there were uh, still unsold bricks stacked up through the yard, which we I think we have some pictures of. But um, one thing we found, let's get back to this image real quick, um, is that uh, already by the 1930s, artists in the region uh, had discovered these places and sort of seized on a, a certain kind of romance uh, that they found there uh, at these these decaying brickyards up and down the river. Uh, this is a painting by Ernest Fine, who was a, uh, a local artist who was also a WPA artist. He did uh, paintings, I think, in some post offices and schools uh, as part of the WPA program. Uh, here is a, a painting that Rob and I found displayed over in Woodstock a few years ago. Uh, there was an exhibit of industrial paintings of industrial scenes on the Hudson River. Uh, this is a, a sort of uh, waning years of a functioning brickyard, it looks like, up in uh, Glasgow near Saugerties. Um, and one of my favorite things that we stumbled upon was a, a reference in Carl Carmer's book, The Hudson, which many of you probably know is one of the sort of uh, seminal uh, kind of travelogue books of the Hudson River. Uh, he writes, the Hudson is lined on both sides with the picturesque weathered ruins of many yards, their chimneys standing lonely beside tumbled weed grown walls and staring empty windows. That was in 1939. So Rob and I were not really uh, <laughs> breaking new ground uh, in our fascination with these places in, in a sense. Um, but so here's the brickyards as we started to find them. Um, and I'll pass this over to Rob. Here we are again at the, the familiar site of the Hudson, the Hutton Brickyard uh, with its kiln sheds, which have a fascinating story. Uh, and they're still around to admire today. So Rob, take it away. Thanks, Tom. And uh, feel free to jump in whenever you're ready to come back up here. We sort of have a, a couple more parts coming up, but Tom and I can jump back around. But uh, starting off with the Hutton Company brickwork, which is really the most significant uh, brickyard, uh, at least in terms of that, it's still standing intact. Um, what are we doing here to go? Here we go. Um, and the bricks themselves can be found all throughout the Hudson River Valley. I think we've even found some at construction sites in New York City. I mean, it's really one of the more commonly found bricks. And as Tom said, it was still making bricks until the late 1970s, which 
would also um, lend into their prominence. And this is a photograph probably from the middle of the 20th century, uh, maybe the 1950s or so. And as Tom had mentioned, there's some interesting history with the site. Well, first of all, it was um, one that was owned the longest by a single family. It started operating around 1865 under the name Courts and Hutton. And the Hutton Company finally sold it in 1965 to the Hova Manufacturing Company. So for about 100 years, it was owned by the Hutton family and a longest continuous stint under the operation of one up operator. And as Tom mentioned, a lot of the early uh, brickyard buildings were kind of the ephemeral temporal buildings, usually built out of wood, contrary to the you know, manufacturing of brick at the site. Um, but these kiln sheds, these three structures here in the lower right side of the picture, actually were built for the Excelsior Brickyard down in Haverstraw and moved up around, what, 1940 or so? And these um, steel kiln structures were really emblematic to Tom and I of the brickyards of the Hudson Valley. That's what we discovered when we first started going out and photographing. Um, but it was really not very typical of the historical brickyards of the Hudson River Valley. As by the time these kind of steel structures came along, many of the brickyards were you know, phasing out of business, as Tom had alluded to earlier. So these structures actually were floated up river on barges from Haverstraw and plunked down here at the Hutton Brickyard in Kingston and really became the kind of the defining feature for us of the brickyards of the late 20th century. And um, the brickyard itself, as we found it, was more or less intact. And we referenced some old maps and we've seen some of the Sanborn maps Tom showed earlier and uh, really were able to figure out you know, what some of the other buildings were and there are still remnants of some of the rail tracks going through here. And this is an aerial view of what the site now looks like today. And I'm sure, uh, has anybody not been there, I should say, at this point? I think they have uh, had a number of events there over the past few years, public events. And now there's these little cabins there you can stay at. And there's a, a bar and restaurant there. So it's a really great resource uh, to go and check out uh, for leisure, but also for some history. You can imbibe some history along with your beverages over there. And um, you know, most of the buildings that we found are still standing. There may have been maybe one or two might have been removed. Uh, since we first photographed it 20 years ago, but um, the main steel kiln sheds are still awaiting preservation. And here's what they look like from the inside if you have not peeked in there yet. And what we're looking at, uh, that brick structure at the end, is the rear uh, portion of one of these uh, scove kilns that had been you know, dismantled and rebuilt continuously for the firing of bricks. And at the time it was going on in the early uh, 2000s and early 2010s, there were uh, proposals to redevelop the property for housing, and there were plans to tear all these buildings down, and Tom and I and others in the area said we should preserve these buildings, so we wrote to Kingston City Hall and to the Society of Industrial Architecture to kind of get some uh, publicity in, out there as far as saving some of these structures. I'm not sure how much weight we carried, but in any event, the developer who was planning to rebuild the site for housing backed out, and these buildings were thankfully not demolished, and as you can see, they're still standing up there today, but you know, waiting actual uh, restoration and reuse. Uh, but there are people who enjoy seeing these kind of industrial structures. This industrial chic is kind of very popular now. And you know, 20 or 30 years ago, parents would never let their kids get anywhere near buildings like this. But when we go up there to these uh, you know, events, they had the flea markets and whatnot, parents are lining their kids up to take pictures outside these buildings. So you know, taste and styles and fashions change. And, and now these buildings are kind of coming into fashion again. And, uh, you know, they also have some weddings there and whatnot. Um, although it's great that the place has been preserved and being put to active use, I think I've probably been spending a little bit less time there now than when it was abandoned. And uh, one of my memories, uh, fondest memories of going there probably about 10 or 12 years ago, um, there were people riding dirt bikes there. There were people fishing, some people just hanging out, enjoying the river scenery. And the, nobody was really bothering anybody. You know, I didn't really feel like unsafe or anything. People were just enjoying the site in their own way and having their own fun. And letting everybody else do their own thing. So it was kind of an unofficial park at the time where people were kind of self-policing their behavior, at least in my experience. It was cheaper, but you had to bring your own food. Yes. <laughs> or you could fish for your own food and cook it on a little you know, handmade barbecue grill right there on the shore, maybe with a pile of bricks holding up your little grill. Um, so that site is, uh, you know, has a, you know, a good present and hopefully a good future for the, the kiln structures there. Uh, there are a lot of other brick structures in the area as well, remnants of some of the old brickyards. And this one is um, now part of the new Sojourner Truth uh, State Park, the Schultz Brickyard Chimney there. Um, one of those kind of weed and covered uh, chimneys that Carl Carmer would have you know, fondly written about almost 100 years ago at this point. 
And here's an image of it in its heyday. And, you know, we see the, the transition from the industrial site and the belching of smoke to this, you know, forested property practically now about. Uh, but that chimney has been preserved and some information is being, you know, posted at the site about it to tell people who walk by what the site was about and information about the past. And this structure here has been referred to as a mule barn. And when we found it had been, um, I guess, kind of chopped up into little offices there for the cement company to operate it in the late 20th century there. But it seems this building is, has a, a bright future as well, where it will be uh, adaptively reused uh, for the new Sojourner Truth State Park. So another good adaptive reuse project. And we're glad to see even these little so-called insignificant or supporting accessory buildings being preserved as well, because they also have a little bit of a story to tell for the history of their properties. And this is the view as it appears from the Hudson River. And our good friend, Fred, who is over here in the front row, has taken us out into the river uh, a handful of times, if not a half dozen or more, to get some photographs of these sites in ways that we would not be able to see or appreciate from the land. So it's nice to get out in the river as well and see these sites that people don't normally get to partake in. So the Schultz chimney is a pretty well-known landmark here in Kingston. You can, as Tom mentioned, you know, walk right up to it or park right below it and walk down from there. But just to you know, maybe a few hundred yards north there is the round boiler chimney from the Terry Brothers Brickyard. And uh, these were the boiler chimneys um, for the brick machine buildings there. And uh, another landmark, but this one a little bit more obscured. And I think it has been recently acquired as maybe an extension, of, if not so true or truth, maybe an adjacent park. So hopefully this building or this structure will stand for a while as well. And Tom had mentioned before the uh, Powell and Minnick Brickworks up in Queens, New York, which was the last operating brickyard and was going up until about 2001 in Queens, about eight miles south of Albany. And this is how I first photographed it. You might have gotten up there before when it was still operating, but I think I got up there maybe two or three years after it officially closed down. Um, this site also had its roots in the middle or late part of the 19th century as the Sutton and Sutterly Brickyard and Pal and Minnick moved in here in the 1960s. There was a, a discovery of shale deposit there, um, and the Pal and Minnick company moved down and basically completely rebuilt the brickyard. But as we found it, uh, they had just closed down. There's all these pallets of brick there outside the old um, kiln shed there, and we wandered around there and had the place to ourselves and admired uh, the buildings, thinking that it probably may not be long for this world, as we already starting to see some other structures disappear. Uh, not only the brickyard building, but these gantry cranes were interesting relics, industrial relics of their time as well. And this little building is still there. This was a coal shed, I think you found, on one of the Sandboard insurance maps. Has anybody been up to Queemans? Do you know the site? Um, this is now an industrial facility, but no longer making bricks, but um, it is what they call a marine salvage terminal. And I guess there's a little bit of recycling going on, and it's kind of like a construction yard as well. Um, this is what we found at one of the modern buildings after Pal and Minnick moved in here. They rebuilt the brickyard. They kept the old kiln shed, but they were now using the tunnel kilns, which were more permanent structures that were not torn down and rebuilt for the firing of brick. But these permanent uh, kiln structures and modern technology, not every brickyard had the finances to rebuild and install modern and more efficient and cleaner machinery, uh, but several of them did, including the Pal and Minnick company. Also has a bit of an interesting history in that the New York State Militia was sent down here to quell a riot in the early 20th century. Uh, the brickyards would typically bring in seasonal laborers from the South and the local workers uh, were really you know, trying to you know, get better working conditions and better wages. Um, it would take a few more decades until really uh, better you know, working labor union efforts would come into the area here. Uh, but all along, you know, workers were trying to you know, make safer and better conditions and get better wages. But the brickyard owners just wanted to, you know, make as much money as possible, like a lot of business people, and brought in laborers uh, to replace those who did go on strike. And there was actually, you know, uh, I think they even fired on the company owner there. And uh, Mr. Uh, Sutterly had to get on a, a barge and escape from being fired upon. And the militia came in and took a couple of days to quell the the armed uprising here in Queemans. But now you go up there and it's just this quiet little country road going past this little uh, marine terminal down there, and you continue on your way up to Albany. And this is what they're building today. This actually was machinery that was going to go on top of some power plant down in New Jersey. 
Uh, they built parts of bridges down there and put them on top of barges and they float them down to New York City and New Jersey and wherever else they're going. So you can kind of stand on top of the hill and where that riot once occurred and see all the construction going on down here today. But uh, Pal and Minnick first began their operations a few miles to the north. And this was a building that we had not really encountered in any of our historical research, in any of the books or maps or anything that we had been reading. And we were taking a walk down Skodak Hotelling Island one day. Has anybody been there? It's a nice park along the river. It's about three or four mile long peninsula down there. Uh, really great place to go and take a walk especially in the winter time, as we like to take photographs in the winter because you can see without the leaves on the trees. And we looked across the river and we saw this little building that kind of looked familiar to us because there is a building like this in Newton Hook. Um, has anybody been to Newton Hook and seen the R&W Scott Ice Company powerhouse, which has been stabilized? So you're familiar with uh, one um, sort of ruin there, not really from the brickyard industry, but it has ties to the brickyards and that some of the brickyards operated in the wintertime as ice harvesting facilities or laborers from the brickyards would go to the, the next door property, which was an ice harvesting facility. And this was a structure that um, operated a conveyor and power system to get those large blocks of ice up into the ice houses. And these ice houses were about 300 feet long, you know, the size of a football field and would have taken up the much more than the width of this photograph here. And but this is where Pal and Minnick first began their operations. And this is what the view of such a building would have looked like about 120 or so years ago with one of those little powerhouses. So this was an accidental discovery that Tom and I made of a building with sort of connection with some of the brickyards. Anything you want to chime in and add? We could talk about Keep how uh, I fell in that. <laughs> I wasn't but, alluding to that. <laughs> what you later refer to as the briny broth of the brickyard <laughs> at this place, but <laughs> but great little brickyard detail or brick details on some of these buildings. Even these you know, kind of small ancillary supporting structures are great pieces of architecture, and we think are worthy of preservation. I'm not sure if we determined if this was on private property or that of like an adjacent cement works, but we had to park in somebody's driveway and we knocked on their door and asked, hey, do you mind if we go down to the bottom of your property and photograph this building we think we saw from the other side of the river? And I'm like, sure, go ahead. <laughs> and this is now on the other side of the river um, in Columbia County, uh, the Cary Brickyard in Newton Hook. And this is one of those places that is relatively undisturbed and that you can probably recreate the entire brickyard and rebuild it there if you wanted to. It would probably be a fascinating site to do an archaeological dig. And it also has remnants of a chimney there. Uh, but these uh, brickyards were vast operations with numbers of different types of buildings and supporting structures. And in the case of the Cary Brickyard, it actually went on both sides of the road over there. Is it Route 9J or 9G? 9J? 9J. And um, a lot of times the brickyard would be on you know one side of the property and it would be a clay pit either you know, adjacent or in this case on the other side of the road. So there was actually a conveyor system that brought clay over to the brickyard where it would be turned into actual bricks. And you can see the kind of the footings of these piers for the conveyor system still. If you look into the woods around the time of this, this time of year. I think this was a remnant of a um, scope kiln as well. So there are all, all sorts of odd bits of these you know, brickyards are still standing in the woods if you kind of venture through the brambles. And we highly recommend going again in the winter, not only for photographic purposes, but in the summertime, I'm sure this is like tick central. So you don't really don't want to go there from like April through November. One of the things that's really remarkable about these sites, you know, even in the context of the different, all the different sites we photographed for the book was these tended to be the, the these one of the things that's so remarkable about these sites you'll see in these photographs is how overgrown so many of them are. I mean, this was one of the, the you know, heaviest industries that operated on the Hudson River. And, uh, you know, of the range of sites that we photographed, the brickyard sites tended to be the, the ones where the vegetation was was really densest and the sites that you, you really can't even bother with these places except for this time of year. And even this time of year, it's quite difficult to do. So it's interesting, you know, the degree to which nat nature's really intensely reclaimed the brickyard sites. And I don't know exactly, I don't know if we ever established why that is particularly in the right near the shoreline, well, they didn't have concrete, you know, floorings or anything like right. that, like a lot of the other factories we've been to. Yep. But this is, I believe, uh, protected property, so there's no imminent threat to these buildings. But, you know, of course, time and the elements can do their work as well. So we always try to get our photographs in while we can. 
this is sort of a, a maybe late winter, early spring view, the footings of those piers of uh, the conveyor system to carry the clay across the road into the brickyard site. Again, I think it'd be a fun archeological project. Another brick that's commonly found uh, throughout the Hudson Valley is the Staples Brickyard, kind of a fun name. And this is over in Malden, back on our side of the river here. And this is also on a uh, public park property. And this is a photograph again from the Hutton book showing uh, the brickyard, um, the brick machine building there on the left, which actually is still standing, believe it or not, being made of brick, of course, um, but the wooden structure to the right and including the drying sheds along the river, if you notice there at the far right, have all since disappeared. Probably the lumber was taken away for, you know, for fuel and fired up and, you know, just taken away probably in the middle of the 20th century, right after these brickyards closed. And this is how it appears today. And this is um, the name of the park down there again. I can't remember. Of course, we're spacing out, but um, there is like a little bit of a turnout on the side of the road there, um, just uh, before cementing. And you can pull off and park and make your way down there. There is sort of an unofficial road that goes past a, a business that I've taken use because it's a shorter road there, but it's not quite easy uh, to get down to unless you do a little bit of clambering. But officially, this is public property. And when we first found it, there was you know overgrown uh, boilers and old junk cars and other things down there. And there was a bit of a cleanup of the property about 15 years ago, presumably by the DEC to remove pollutants and things like that. And they took down the chimney here, but left the boiler structure. This is one of my favorite photographs that Tom has taken. And here's another view of what it actually looked like from the riverfront with the drying sheds there and the gantry crane, if you notice, which we actually first photographed uh, probably again around 2004 or so. And we had hoped that it would be one of those kind of cool industrial relics that would stick around. You could you know, tell where you were on the river when you see these kind of structures there. Uh, but it too came down when the, I presume the DEC came in and cleaned up the property. And again, there were all these little workers' houses on the property. There were probably about three or four, I think, that we first found when we came through there. One was pretty much intact, but I think they've all pretty much you know, pancaked like the one on the bottom right there has. And of course, uh, along the brick, uh, along the river today is where you'll find those treasures of brick that Tom mentioned from the scope kilns that were discarded and thrown down there. A lot of them are broken, um, but you can find some good gems in there. And uh, as we've gone out with Fred, you have to have a lot of patience and kind of a sense of, you know, knowing which brick to turn over, which might have a, a, a brand on it, or, you know, just keep, you know, working until you find a good one. But there's still lots of treasures to be found there. The river and the ice will turn over the bricks from time to time as well. So it's just kind of a fun little excursion to go down there and, and dig through and see what you can find. You want to take over at any point? You can keep going. <laughs> uh, so this is a place that not too many people know about. I'm not sure what the status of this property is. I don't think it's officially a public park, but it's kind of adjacent to a park. Uh, this is one we found out kind of late. I don't think we knew about it until we had finished writing the book, if I'm not mistaken. It was sort of the time where the online aerial maps were still kind of fuzzy and you really couldn't tell what you were looking at. And sometimes we just kind of had to drive around until we find things and got out and walked around. And I think you had maybe discovered this before I did, maybe around 2006 or so. And it was hard to find. We had someone here whose father, I think, worked at this brickyard. Yep. <laughs> Do you recognize this building? Can you tell us exactly what happened in this building? Oh, no. I haven't been, to, been down to that in probably about 70 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, as Tom mentioned before, it's very rare that any of the brickyard buildings were constructed out of brick. And those that were were like mule barns or things like that, or maybe a building for the, the brick machine. But this one um, is a rather... Um, long structure, you know, probably like 200 feet long and almost kind of has the characteristics of maybe, you know, a little bit of a mule barn and garage and maybe some other structures. We're really not too sure. We're just throwing guesses out there. Got to find the fire insurance map for this one. Yeah, sometimes they don't really do the, the little out of the way places, you know. Um, but atop the hill, we climbed up the top of the hill and we found this little structure, which seemed to have been like a two family apartment house, maybe built for the brickyard manager, a fantastic view looking over the winter, uh, over the river there. And we first um, went up there, it was pretty heavily overgrown, um, but you know, very picturesque ruin. And we went up there again a few years ago, and it looked like a lot of the land behind it had been cleared away for a potential housing development. Does anybody know the site or know what's going on at the moment? It's been a couple of years, but you were up there more recently, and, I, and this building was still there, right? I think it is now a housing development. When, when we last saw it was 2022. And this ruin was still there, looking almost as picturesque as it does in the picture. But 
uh, you know, behind the back of Rob's, when he took this photo, behind Rob's back taking this photo, the land had all been cleared and tract housing was laid out. Uh, this is off Route 32, just below Saugerties. Yeah. So, so is this the fact of the lost firm? Yes, this is just up to Hilton okay, Water. Yeah, I think somebody bought a lot of land for development there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating too, the personal histories, and we'd love to hear from people who lived and worked at these places. And yes, it's been many generations removed, but yeah, you know, I've gotten maybe a couple of emails over the years from people, but um, fewer and far between, again, since it's been, as you said, like 70 or 80 years since people even last went up there. And some of these cases, you know, some of these brickyards haven't operated in about 100 years or so. Many of them started going out of business in the 1920s and 30s. And then particularly, again, in the 1940s and 50s, there was kind of another wave where brickyards either went out or decided to modernize and update. And as you mentioned, I think only about maybe eight or 10 were really operating into the maybe the late 1950s. This was a little trail that led down from the top of the hill down to the river, probably had like a small kind of railroad, maybe carrying material through the property. And uh, some of these places did have brick pathways through the site as well, or brick roads. Not sure if these were meant to be permanent or sometimes installed temporarily, but you can often you know dig under the leaves and find some interesting treasures over there as well. This one is probably the hardest one to get to, and I think I've only really been there properly once, the Empire Brickyard in Stockport, which has also been you know, preserved um, in the last few years or so. I think it's about 400 acres of riverfront land there, and they have now put up like a little interpretive sign at the top of the road, about a mile long dirt road that leads down to the river. But as Fred and I found out a few years ago, part of the road has washed out, and you kind of have to scramble through the woods to actually get down even to the brickyard site proper, but it's heavily overgrown. And when I went there, maybe again, about 2004 or five or so, there was about maybe six of these kiln walls standing. So remnants of about three or so individual kilns were still standing here at the Empire Brickyard. And Tom mentioned about you know, how the coal or the uh, oil was you know, projected into the kiln to be fired, to uh, heat up the bricks on the inside. This is where it would have happened, these little openings on the side there. So I think there's some interesting archaeology to be done at some of these sites. But the easiest thing to do is simply to go to these properties and walk around on your own. Are there any actual brick collectors in the room here? Any actual hobbyists? It's a fun hobby. Don't be ashamed if you are. And um, I think the best place that Tom and I found for this hobby was at Duchess Junction. And I think we found maybe like 12 or 13 different brands there when we went there, maybe like seven or six years ago. Yeah, I don't think anyone's established the limit yet to how many different Frogmark brands there are on bricks you can find at Duchess Junction. So maybe, who here can point to Junk, Duchess Junction on a map? There's at least one person. Duchess Junction is on the Duchess County shoreline just below Beacon. And like a lot of brickyards, they often would change ownership You know, over time. There might be one company might have operated for five or 10 years and another company would come in. So any individual brickyard, you can probably find at least three or four different brands, or as Tom called them, Frogmark, which is a name that brick collectors and brick makers have for that indentation in there where the um, name of the brick maker would appear. And the Hammond Company was the most prominent uh, manufacturer of bricks in Dutchess Junction, just south of Beacon. And we actually found the superintendent's house was still standing there when we first photographed it. It was kind of an interesting structure because it was built with what they called Lamby brick, this kind of overfired or hardened or blackened brick that typically wasn't used in building construction, may have been considered waste. It was usually like the inner part of the kiln, if I'm not mistaken, the overfired brick. But sometimes people did make buildings out of them. It was kind of very decorative. And uh, in this case, they, they made the superintendent's house out of it. And Fred and I went there with some other brick hunters about maybe 2018 or so. And we looked all around for this building. We thought we were in the right spot, but there was actually a little bit of sliver of land that was privately owned. And we think that somebody bought that little sliver of land and demolish this building. So Tom and I just have a few cursory photographs. And unfortunately, when we first started doing this, we shot a lot of this on film. So we were like, oh, let's take one or two pictures and then move on. Whereas now we would take like 100 digital shots. We'd walk around the whole building, you know. Got an update. Found the house again. It's still there? Yeah. Uh, it is still Dan there. Cole found it. He went down there with a friend or something looking around. I wonder how we missed it. Well, I don't know. I mean, it looked like the devil, didn't it? Well, let's take us back there and show us. I didn't see it. You were telling me. 
I don't know. So when we, you know, couldn't find that building again, but just total coincidence, I found this building on Spring Street in Beacon, which was also built of Lamby brick. And it actually was kind of briefly popular in the 1920s. A fellow by the name of Rosefitter Atterbury built a lot of buildings in um, Queens, New York, using Lamby bricks, apartment buildings, and, and maybe some private homes. So it actually did kind of come into fashion for a little while to use these kind of discarded or rejected bricks as a little bit of architectural ornamentation. And here's one example you can see in Beacon. And this building um, was gone just before Tom and I started traveling around with our cameras. Anybody ever take the train through Beacon and see the Brockway Brickyard in the 1990s? It's really escaped a lot of people's memories. And again, maybe people weren't paying attention to industrial buildings in the 1990s before it became fashionable, which is kind of like these old industrial structures that no one's using anymore. Let's tear them down. So this was a video I just happened to find on YouTube. Somebody had actually gone there in the 90s, probably with a little handheld camcorder. And, you know, I think they posted about five minutes or so of video walking around the buildings. And like the Hutton and Powell and Minnick brickyards, it had uh, a set of these steel kiln sheds and a number of other uh, office buildings and things like that. And today, this is all that is left of the site. Um, again, it was probably demolished maybe 1995 or so. And Tom and I were just taking out our cameras in our own backyards around that time. It's starting to spread out. But um, by the time I got up to the beacon, uh, these buildings were gone a good five years at least or more. Uh, but this railroad over the track is a remnant of the brickyard and uh, is the only thing that's still left. I presume it's still there. We took this photograph maybe four or five years ago. Uh, but along the shore, there's another good spot to go and find some bricks. I don't think it's officially open, but we saw it a trail. The people had cut through the tall grass to go to the riverfront and do some fishing or hanging out there, but also a good place to explore and find some bricks. And then there's a the Dennings Point Brickworks, also in Beacon. Um, interestingly, the Dennings Point had closed, I think, in the 1930s and they actually moved up to Brockway and reestablished themselves there and were operating through the 1960s. So a lot of the the DPBW bricks you find may have actually been made at the Brockway site. And uh, Dennings Point uh, has an interesting history and it's been reused. And there are some buildings undergoing preservation. Unfortunately, this building, which we think may have been a, a blacksmith shop, not quite sure, um, has been demolished. So a few buildings have disappeared, but um, some have been stabilized and been preserved. This is how we found another large building, which is now the center of Beacon Institute for Rivers and Estuaries by Clarkson University. So, again, just going back and forth, you see the before and the after. <laughs> Good place to go and take a walk around and explore and see some old brickyard history. Anything you want to chime in and in? No, time. Do, do for a new visit there. Yeah, definitely do for a revisit. Um, so, having gone through the brickyard industry, we'll take a look at some buildings that have been made of brick in the Hudson Valley, and Tom will probably give some exclamation, uh, explanations about uh, some misconceptions people might have about brick and how brick is used in construction. And, uh, you know, we'll look at some famous buildings and some maybe not so famous, but all of which have their own little appeal to us in different ways here. And I'll turn this part over to Tom for a little bit and we'll jump back and forth. Well, another one of the, the sort of interesting facts about Hudson River brick is that uh, this was uh, the brick often that was really kind of the workhorse brick. And, and very often you'll see brick buildings and the brick that you see on the facade of the building is not Hudson River brick. This this uh, is a detailed photo. I'm tempted to ask if anyone could guess which building this is, but I think it's a little too, a little, a little tough. The Park Avenue Armory in New York City, which, which my firm has done some restoration work on. And here the walls uh, kind of pulled apart. And so you can see the brick that's in this case likely to be Hudson River brick. Uh, you go far enough back into the 19th century and the bricks don't have those frog marks on them, so you can't tell which brickyard they came from. That was really more an advent of about the early 20th century onwards. Uh, so this wall, you know, it's always, it's so frustrating when they don't have, <laughs> um, but uh, it, here's the wall kind of pulled apart again, and you could see the the face brick is, uh, in this case, what's called pressed brick, which was probably molded in a, in a metal uh, brick mold, whereas the, the backup brick uh, in my little napkin diagram, which I drew for Rob at a restaurant one night, uh, uh, colored uh, red uh, in that sketch, is likely to be the Hudson River brick. So often if you see yellow brick, buff colored brick, uh, brick that's any color other than pink, it's, you know, it's not a Hudson River brick. Uh, but that said, I mean, to provide an estimate of what percentage of the buildings in New York City, uh, you know, 
collectively employed Hudson River brick, I mean, could it be 80 or 90 percent? I mean, even if the skin that you see in the outside is not a Hudson River brick, the Hudson River brick is, like I said, really kind of the, the workhorse um, of the brick. And some buildings, though, um, so it's somewhat unusual to see buildings that uh, where the, the brick on the outside of the wall um, is uh, is that Hudson River brick made in a wooden mold that's not necessarily the most consistent in color and not necessarily the, the neatest uh, at its edges, um, used for industrial buildings and factories, sure, but for residential buildings and churches and things like that, it's somewhat unusual to see Hudson River brick used as the, the outer skin of the wall, but we have a few examples of prominent buildings uh, in the Hudson Valley, and particularly in the brickyard towns themselves, where you do run into buildings like that. Uh, notably, Rob, this one. Anybody taking the boat ride out to Bannerman's Island Arsenal? Go see it soon if you haven't. Always good to check it out. And uh, they have a great boat tour that goes out there and a great tour around the island. They have lots of events out there as well. And really just one of the greatest ruins anywhere. Hudson River, New York, the world. It's on all sorts of websites and lists. And it was the private military surplus warehouse of Francis Bannerman VI, who is a purveyor of military surplus goods in the late 19th and early 20th century. And it was built uh, his castle out of Hudson River brick, uh, most of which came from Dutchess Junction, which we talked about earlier, which was just about a mile north of Palapal Island, the official name of the island the structure was built upon. And I've been uh, out there many times over the years and have probably come up with maybe uh, at least a half dozen bricks, probably a bunch more as well. Uh, maybe they don't have marks on them. Um, but a lot of this structure was built prominently of Hudson River brick just from the, the shoreline nearby. So it's a great place to go and, and see some brickyard history and look up at you know, the river, see where the brickyards used to be, which are now all heavily overgrown and protected parklands. And uh, in this case, Tom talked about you know before some of the trees falling over and you finding the, the bricks and the roots. Well, at Bannerman's Castle, parts of the building has fallen over. And when that happened, you know the building is exposed and you see the actual names of the brick yard makers and the brick on the inside there. And one thing, one thing that the, the photograph on the top right actually illustrates, although it, it almost does a bad job of illustrating it, is that those frog marks served uh, a function in that they were the, the mortar between the bricks could key into them and kind of grab onto the brick uh, a little bit better. Although whatever happened to that part of Bannerman's castle on the top, right? Uh, it didn't grab on good enough in any case. And this is probably the oldest brick uh, structure intact that we found and photographed the Yan Van Hosen house in Claverick, the home of Yan and Tanneke Van Hosen. Uh, Jan van Hosen was a mariner, which uh, probably afforded him a little bit of status and privilege to build uh, such an elaborate house for his time, probably in the 1720s or so. We haven't figured out an exact date yet, but I think it's been placed between like 1720 and 1730. And this was indeed kind of a grand home for the upper Hudson Valley at the time. And today it stands at the entrance to the Dutch Village Mobile Home Trailer Park. And um, it's been kind of protected and preserved, but it hasn't been restored. I think maybe there's some restoration has been ongoing and offgoing. We have to get up there and, and get back in touch with the folks who are invested and interested in the property. And it is made out of Hudson River brick, but as Tom mentioned, you won't find the, the frog mark or the brand uh, on there since this is long before that process was um, being done. But there are clinker bricks in the end of the building with the ITBH for Yan and Tanneke Van Hosen, which is interesting use of the clinker to, you know, Put their mark on the building and identify who owned it and uh, just an interesting use of brick material and of course um, one of the more elaborate brick structures is the Wincliffe mansion in Rhinebeck which is kind of losing a piece of the building every day as this time marches on and when we first photographed it it was not quite intact but you could sort of see like what the house was and where it used to be and, and more and more large chunks have come down every few years since uh, we first went up there in the late 1990s. Uh, but we got permission to go up there a few years ago from the present owner. So I had the leisure of setting up my tripod and taking pictures all day long and getting all the details I wanted and uh, really appreciating the, the brickwork and the detail and the handicraft that went into making this building and hoping that, you know, the present owners have some luck in stabilizing what is left of the building. Not sure what they can and will be able to do with it, but we we're able to get uh, one last good close up peek uh, look at it in its present state and hopefully it'll be protected and kept around, but that depends on resources and what the elements of time are going to do to it. And there's this place called Brick Row in Athens, New York, and I think we recently found there was a Brick Row in Wappingers Falls as well, where there was an unfortunate 
um, explosion. Uh, but this is a neat little piece of real estate just off the main road, just north of the village of Athens, or do they say Athens? Athens. Athens, okay. Thank you. <laughs> and um, probably if, if I had the, the resources maybe a long time ago or the will to move up the area, I would have loved to have lived in a place like this. There's all these little individual row houses there um, built out of brick, but it was actually built um, for a railroad terminus, if I'm not mistaken. The um, see if I can find that for the Saratoga and Hudson Railroad, whose terminal was located directly behind the houses, and the short-lived uh, railroad ceased operations in 1876, and its uh, adjacent docks were destroyed in this fire a little bit later on. Um, so the house is a brick row, a uh, 19th-century workers' housing development is still standing, and looks pretty much as it did, you know, well over 100 years ago. So it's a great little piece of Hudson River architectural history that, again. It, not really known to many people, kind of located off the main road. I guess we probably saw the street sign that said Brick Row. We said we have to go down there and see what's down there, right? And go ahead. There's another one up in Castleton, Brick Road. Brick Road. Brick Road. Or Brick Street, or whatever they call it. Is there like a workers' housing on that street as well? Uh, looks like a place where. Uh, Park Department or whatever chopped a lot of brush and trees. Oh, oh yeah, been there. that <laughs> happens too. And in areas where a lot of brick was extensively made, you would see a lot of homes and other municipal structures made out of brick. And in a lot of places, they're interesting and unique styles. They're kind of unique to each individual house. And so maybe Tom might want to talk a little bit about some of these, which are some of your favorite homes. Well, no, I, I think you said it, but I mean, as Rob and I. Uh, drove uh, drive around the Hudson Valley. We always find when we get into, you can almost sort of tell that you're near where there used to be a brickyard when you start to see houses like these, little bungalows, ranch houses, even that anywhere else would be uh, probably aluminum sided or you know wood frame clabbered houses. But uh, here, just south of Saugerties, there's this, this cluster. Uh, you, if you pay attention, you start to look around, you start to notice that almost every building on both sides of the road uh, is built out of local Hudson River brick. And these are some my favorite examples that we go by. Here's another one in East Kingston, typical example uh, of the kind of building that, you know, almost anywhere else, this would probably be a wood frame house standing, you know, in a, in a not very urban area uh, like that one is. Um, here's a school building up in East Kingston, just up the road from us now. Uh, but this is one of, uh, you know, the favorite examples of enthusiasts of this uh, uh, subject. And is anybody, well, Roston, it's on the slide there. Uh, has anyone seen this building? Yeah, there's a couple of hands that go up because it's well off the beaten path. The, you, as you're going south of here towards Newburgh, uh, just before you get to Newburgh, uh, there's a couple of turnoffs that'll take you down to where Roseton used to be. It's not so much a community anymore. It's yeah. not really you much have of a to downtown. You kind of appreciate power plants and oil tanks to want to go down there. Okay. But uh, right, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, those power plants, Dan Scammer and Roseton power plants, are built on the site of brickyards. Uh, and there's not much left to see of those brickyards. But one thing that you can see is this. Uh, chapel, which was, I believe the story is that this was built by the family that ran the brickyard for the brickyard uh, workers. And it's just, a, it's one of the most beautiful, uh, you know, I think, uh, brick buildings of any kind up and down the Hudson River. But really the story behind it and the connection with the brickyard uh, is, I think, what makes this so special. And I think they, uh, you know, it was almost a statement being made to build this kind of a building out of Hudson River brick, the kind of building that maybe would have been built uh, using fancier brick or stone uh, anywhere else. But in this case, it's built using local Hudson River brick. Here's one, Rob, that you photographed. So the Dutch Garden in New City is located next to the uh, New City Town Hall. And it's a WPA memorial to the Dutch colonizers who did, uh, and was designed by a, in a formal 17th century Dutch garden tradition. The architect was a woman named Mary Mowbray Clark, and the work was done around 1934 to 1938, and it won a Garden of the Year Award from Better Homes and Garden Magazines, and um, it was a master craftsman. It was a fellow by the name of Bialo Gugliuzzo of Garnerville. I'm sorry if I probably totally butchered that name there, um, but a fellow from a local brickyard or brickyard uh, village and uh, used local bricks for the materials in the construction of the garden here. And there's just some really great details uh, in the buildings there, uh, motifs referencing the early Dutch settlers and ships and, and things like that and uh, floral designs. So great place to go and check out uh, some bricks and brick handiwork and architecture. And so what is the legacy of brick today besides, oh, is there a question? Not so much a question. Or comment. If I wait, if I wait to the end, you won't have that vision in your mind. 
there's a fantastic link between the Mowbray Clark family that decades after yep. the famous exhibition at the Park Avenue Armory, we've already seen a little detail from the mm -hmm. armory. They actually mortgaged an older structure where they live and put the money up as the capital to create the armory show. So excellent. The structure you displayed from the Depression era was, you know, two decades later, I would admit. But oh, wow. so I, I used to live down in Rockland County. So I, I know when you mentioned Mowbray Clark, it did it, it, it prompted a comment. That's Thank you for adding to that. We appreciate that. We always learning love to learn a little bit and, more from people. And the, and the and the frame house with the brick addition from the late 19th century fell down before anybody could figure out taking care of the, oh, no. the, the, the legacy of the people who created, in essence, the armor show. Hmm. Oh. Well, thank you. So what is the legacy of bricks and brick making today? As Tom mentioned, the last brickyard closed in 2001. We had just started trotting out the Hudson River with our cameras and documenting these places. There was one brickyard operating and then it closed down. So nobody's been making brick here for now 23 years after three and a half centuries or so of brick making in the Hudson River Valley. An industry has been uh, long prominent and supported workers and families no longer exist here. Uh, so what is there to do? Well, you can collect bricks and there's the International Brick Collectors Association with nearly uh, 700 members uh, throughout the world, United States, Canada, Great Britain, New Zealand, Australia, and France, and uh, all sorts of interesting bricks, and sometimes they have, um, you know, Cyrillic lettering. I think you found maybe shown some examples, and sometimes they have uh, logos or symbols on them. But usually, most commonly, just a name. Uh, sometimes a year or a date. But a uh, fascinating group to belong to. And the fun thing is, to, to, is that when they have these brick collectors swap meets, nobody sells bricks. Like there's no value associated with the brick. It's not like one is worth. Ten dollars, or one is worth a dollar, but brick collectors will only swap bricks with each other, but not sell them. So it's something not to be commodified. It's just a pure and simple sure. hobby, which really adds to the enjoyment of it. And of course, there's the Haverstraw Brick Museum down in Haverstraw, where also Tom mentioned one of the other great centers of brick manufacturing in the Hudson River Valley. I think the last brickyard closed there around 1942, um, give or take, and uh, they have a great museum there with a fantastic collection of bricks and uh, lots of awesome programs. So definitely do go and check them out and wander along the shore and maybe find a brick or two of your own. And our friend Fred here is a collaborator with our friend Don Bailey and the brick site uh, website brickcollecting.com. And it's pretty much devoted to the Hudson River Valley, but they have um, forums and Q and A's where people can submit you know, information about bricks all around the country or even in Canada. Actually, Fred and I got an email a few months ago from somebody in Ontario who found a brick with the same name. It's a brick maker in the Hudson River Valley, but it was a different kind of brick. And we said, no, your brick was probably made somewhere else. And Fred found out it was probably made like, you know, Ohio or somewhere. Yeah. And uh, I remember it wasn't too long ago. And yeah. the person had a like a kind of little show and tell contest in their town. I said, yeah, I bet your your, your brick is going to win a prize. And she actually ended up winning first place. I think it was like a five dollar prize. I was like, I, think I told you so. Question? I didn't realize that um, where I was living in Far Rockaway, it's old brick houses. They're not where I'm living now. But, and I just looked it up here, and the the police um, station is supposed to be a historic building. And it's right uh -huh. there. But all the houses there in that one part of Far Rockaway, it's, it's just all one brick building after another. Wow. And and likely could, Hudson River brick. Yeah, probably. Yeah. And I could have bought one of those houses, but I didn't have the fifty thousand dollars. Yeah. <laughs> Back in the day. It's and, but anyhow, they're they're still all there. All of what they call the Reeds Lane area, there it's just a whole bunch of brick houses. Is is that like a big deal, or was there like brick houses everywhere? I mean, as Tom said, a lot of times people put aluminum siding on them or, you know, some kind of cladding and they get covered up. But it's still all brick with front yeah. porches. And... Yeah, that is very interesting. Yeah, very cool. We'd love to live in a place like that, too, I'm sure. Yeah, it's it's yeah. a legacy of the, mm -hmm. of, of the brick industry in the Hudson River and its proximity to New York, which yeah. is what, you know, supported the industry for most of its history. Are you interested in seeing what this, what the, the 
police station looks like? I mean, I never thought of it. Yeah, I actually know that building. Yeah. You see that? Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah, I know it. Believe it or not. Yeah. I tried to buy it all the time, but I think it's beautiful. Just on, on the news two days ago, both sides of the apartment house uh, they said was built around 100 years ago. The whole, the whole walk. In yes, the, the, the Bronx, and... the Bronx, the recent Bronx apartment building collapse was also probably had some river branch, <laughs> unfortunately. And and we know some brick collectors who will be uh, rapid response yeah. to the situation. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, that was like a miracle, though, that nobody got killed. And the, right. the apartment just got opened up, and you see the bed and the and the, uh, the doorway. Well, that's out. some some guilt free collecting then. <laughs> there are a quite a few number of notable brick collectors. Uh, Alan Gilbert from Fordham University is a professor of anthropology and uh, organized the New Netherland, New York Brick Archive at Fordham University. So he had a fantastic collection there, one of the probably earlier people uh, to really kind of kind of do a scholarly study of bricks and all the different brand names and things like that. And there are artists who get into this kind of stuff, too. And this is the uh, structure called Manifest Destiny by the artist Carl Andre at the Judd Foundation in New York City. Have you been there yet? I have I, not. I, I think I may have taken this picture. You may have taken the picture. <laughs> I got an email from them probably 10 or 12 years ago saying, people keep knocking this thing over and it's damaging the bricks. Where can we find more Empire Bricks? And I think they went up to the, the Empire Brickyard and salvaged a few and maybe rebuilt it. Um, but this was uh, made at 101, String, 101 Spring Street for an exhibition in 1986 to benefit the War Resisters League and composed of Stack Brick, found of the uh, Empire Brickyard Company. And probably using the name as a bit of a, a statement there, perhaps. And oftentimes you find these bricks in the weirdest places. Where was that the Art Westchester staircase, I think? This is in the stair at Lehigh Building in New York, oh, where Lehigh. I worked for a little bit. And I was walking down the hallway, and there it was <laughs> every time I walked by. And I mean, one of the, the fun things about this as a hobby is you see these frog marks in the brick, and often in planters and places like that. It could be all over New York City or up here, too. And it's great to look and say, I know where that came from. <laughs> Uh, what did uh, Gilbert call his uh, collection? The New Netherland New York Brick Archive at Fordham University. Oh, New, uh, New, New Netherland New, New York Brick Archive. New Netherland. And there are more contemporary artists such as Julia Whitney Barnes. Anybody familiar with her awesome work? She does all sorts of different mediums and styles, but a few years back, her thing was bricks, and she collected bricks and did these installations on people's lawns and outside of Wilderstein, and uh, was there one in New Paltz, and I think uh, in Poughkeepsie as well, and she uh, glazes and refires the bricks and gives them this kind of fancy, colorful palette and displays them in different places, and recreating the shape of the Hudson River intentionally. It's not just a random shape. It's meant to be evocative of the shape and course of the Hudson River. And our friend Stephanie Lewison, uh, who the uh, Wall Street Journal found has 400 bricks in her basement. Us brick collectors find all sorts of places to keep our bricks. We run out of room in our basement. They're in our car trunk or they're in our closets or uh, who knows where else in the backyard. But um, as you can see, there's kind of almost a limitless number of brick marks that you can collect. And some are pretty common and some are very obscure. And Stephanie was one of the more prolific people in finding some of those obscure uh, frog marks and brick brands. And uh, Fred here and our good friend Andy Vanderpool as well, who lives nearby, probably are two esteemed uh, collectors here who have historical knowledge of all the different bricks. And when we have questions, these are the people that we go to. And Fred has certainly answered more than a handful of our emails over the years. This is how Andy displays his bricks. He built his own display rack in his uh, garage there. Uh, with individual slots for each brick and a tag for each brick underneath that he would write out in marker. And as you can see, a lot of times they're in that just kind of a, a maybe you could explain the font better, but sometimes they're just standard font. Sometimes they're fancy and italicized. Spencerian script, like Coca-Cola or <laughs> Ford. Yeah. <laughs> so the fun is kind of collecting some of those rare examples. And this is Andy's own list, and he uh, has the brick Mark on the left there, the frog mark, the company who actually made it, the quality of the brick that he found, and where it was located when he found it. 
And uh, sometimes we try to find the best brick possible, but sometimes you just find a broken brick and take it home. So that's the best I'm going to find at this place because it's pretty rare. And Arts Westchester was in on it as well, a great museum in White Plains, New York. And brick was becoming very popular in the last five or 10 years. And they did a whole exhibit uh, tied into the anniversary of the Erie Canal, uh, with brick being one of the major materials that we use uh, as, as a transport, as a product and also in construction around that time, the Erie Canal and the building boom. So all sorts of different artists were invited to display their work, whether it was a sculpture or a photograph uh, or historical um, you know, recollection over video or just, um, donation of artifacts and um, how bricks were made, uh, also part of the display as well. And there's also a lot of social history, some people who had ties to the brickyards and brickyard workers contributed their memories and stories of their families who worked there. Uh, I think it's just really, maybe you can say more about this, it's just really awesome evocative photograph there. And the way some of the guys are holding some of the bricks there, I wonder if there's some kind of symbolism or meaning in the gestures they've got. Well, the real trophy that they've got, which you can see at the bottom is that wooden brick mold, which every once in a while turns up uh, somewhere Rob found some at a garage sale. I did not. Our friend Tina well, found it. You, yeah, you indirectly <laughs> found it. <laughs> I'm still in the market, though, if anybody had. The, well, the museum here has a, a couple of them, right? The, yeah, the museum has a few brick molds anyway. So, yeah, the three of these were on display here, and they turn up once in a while. Sometimes people charge like two or $300 for them, and I think our friend Tina got them for like $5 maybe at somebody's garage sale and didn't know what they were and just picked them up. And uh, so they're pretty few and far between uh, to come by. So if you see one, it is a real and veritable treasure. They're not worth very much at all. No, <laughs> not worth much. <laughs> <laughs> so our display of uh, 40 selected bricks was at the New York State Museum in 2016 and 17, part of our photography and architectural exhibit at the State Museum in Albany. And we chose 40 uh, representative bricks uh, to put on display there, along with some of the photographs of some brick buildings there. It was a real treat to have our work at the State Museum. And you go on YouTube, there's all sorts of fascinating videos. And this one is a 28-minute documentary, The Hudson River Brickmakers. Uh, all sorts of awesome stuff can, being turned up every day. So uh, there's probably things up there that I haven't seen yet. So I haven't done a search in a while, but go and take a look and check this out when you get home. And go to the Hutton Brickyard, have your wedding there, have a have a dinner there, have a drink there, spend a night in one of their cabins, you know, so history uh, comes alive. Uh, so I think this is our maybe our last slide or maybe our second to last slide, but, um, you know, Fred had a great quote at the Arts Westchester exhibit in White Plains. Every brick we find has a story behind it. Indiana Jones has nothing on us. So, uh, again, lots of history hunting and detecting to be done in this little hobby there. And you just go and you walk around, you find some bricks and who made it? Whose hand held this? You know, and who are the people behind this? What's the story here? Why was this left behind? So all sorts of things to be discovered. But um, there are still places around the world where brick is being made in, in almost kind of the same fashion that brick was being made in the Hudson River 120 years ago. So I'll turn this last part over to Tom if we have a minute or two for our bonus feature. If you could stand another three minutes of us, uh, we've gone a little bit long, but there we have a little yeah. bonus feature at the end, which is uh, to introduce it a, a two minute uh, film that I compiled with. A few years ago, I was in Bangladesh to travel through the, for a trip through the, the Ganges Brahmaputra Delta. And one thing I did not expect to find there was uh, one of the world's last great clusters of working brickyards, which mm -hmm. turns out India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh are real centers of uh, brick making. And because these are places that do not have the kinds of regulations that places like the United States and Europe have now, uh, the conditions in these brickyards uh, are interestingly very much like the conditions uh, in brickyards on the Hudson River 150 years ago or more. Uh, and so I'll play the video now. Uh, one interesting thing uh, to note, so this is the, the video is in two minutes kind of a, a walk through the process uh, of how the bricks are made in Bangladesh uh, at this very moment this is happening. I'm sure they go around the clock. Uh, and uh, it's very similar to what we saw in those photographs at the beginning of the, the talk. Uh, the one thing that's different is that whereas uh, the brick machine was invented here on in the Hudson River and was used in Hudson River brickyards uh, in the 19th century, they are still not using brick machines, but they're still doing it by hand in Bangladesh, uh, interestingly. So here we go. Clay pit. 
Hey, I mean, this almost looks like they're building the pyramids. Digging clay out and then hauling it over to be put into mold. I've never seen anyone work as fast in my entire life. He's a little slow here because he'd stopped to talk for a second before he realized he'd better get back to work. Frog marks, just like we had in the Hudson River Brick. Here they're hauling coal out of a small bulker to bring over to the kilns, and they still use scove kilns. They're a slightly different kind of variation of the scum kiln. Uh, scum, scove kilns that were used here. Here they're firing the, the scove kiln from the top using coal dust. The dust that I'm standing on top of here is actually the kiln. Same sort of size and shape as the kilns that you would see remnants of over the hot brick yogurt. And now being shipped out by boat or delivered by boat as was done here. I don't think the carrying by head was done here in this room. Uh, not sure. And then this is a, a, a video. This is on the Hooghly River south of Calcutta uh, about a year after the previous video, just showing each one of these smokestacks is a brickyard. Uh, no kind of environmental regulations of the kind we have here. So you can just imagine, well, can, you can get a sense of the air quality and seeing how these get harder and harder to see as you get away. And that is it. So, won't, won't feel so bad going back to work tomorrow after that. Um, but thank you all very much again for coming. Thanks to the museum for having us. The Hudson River Maritime Museum is uh, one of the great repositories of material related to the Hudson River brick industry. Also, a number of the images that uh, we borrowed from George Hutton's book are images that are in the collection here of the Hudson River Maritime Museum, as well as some artifacts, too. Um, and I think we have time for questions, and we'll hang around also uh, if we, uh, we want. We do have books also yeah. uh, which, that we can sign and a Sharpie marker. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, thank you again. Any, any questions? I have a question. Or comments. Or com it's fascinating. Thank you. There's a little museum down uh, on 9W, Kleinosophus Museum, and I think they have probably 40, 50 bricks. Huh. Nice. They're all you know, kind of piled together in a frame. They've, they've been painted different colors, but they're all different name bricks. I don't know that means. Yeah, literally mm -hmm. five miles from here. I think I know names I've never been in. It's open very rarely in the yeah. weekend. Yeah. No, it's open more now. Yeah, it's open it? more now. Yeah. There's actually the new museum president has his name on the door, and you can just call him, and he lives, lives next door. There. Oh, that's okay. Is it, it, he'll check it out. He'll come right. over and Open awesome, up. thank you for telling us. Okay. So, thank you. This is a photo of my friend's house in Far Rockaway. Look at the detail. I never saw it. It's got three porches. Wow. That's yes, awesome. there's some fairly grand houses out there. Um, for sure. Nice street on the corner. We should take a trip over there, too. Huh. Yeah. But yes. I, I didn't realize this was so special because she's got three separate porches a porch here, a porch here, a porch here. Yeah. Were they originally maybe like a two or three family house? It still is. It still is. Ah, okay. okay. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, she's got three apartment actually. Nice. Yeah. Very cool. One of those lists, it, it was saying the mark and the owner of the company, and then it's had a the grade of brick, and they were all A and B bricks. What's the story with the grade of brick, and when did they start this grading? And this no, that was Andy's own system, because yeah. sometimes we find bricks are, like, perfectly intact. Sometimes they're chipped and maybe part of the letter is missing, things like that. So that's just his own personal rating. The builders in New York City who are buying bricks, did they have a way of saying, no, those guys' bricks are better than those guys' bricks, or were they all standardized? There were some standardizations that came in the 20th century, and the Hudson River bricks, unfortunately, kind of got a bad rap, uh, unknowingly so. Um, but it turned out, you know, people thought they had... Uh, poor quality related to like water retention and freezing and cracking, but it turned out oh. that was a bit more of a myth. So yes, there were standards, particularly more like in the middle of the 20th century, 1930s and 40s, which kind of coincided with Hudson River brick going out of fashion. But the Hudson River brick, like I said, was was the workhorse brick. It was not the fancy brick 
Uh, it was it was the sort of backup brick, the basement brick, uh, the interior wall brick, uh, and the fancier brick would be used usually for the the skin of a building. Um, and the industry, because it was so old and kind of disappeared so long ago, to a large degree, I would say predates the era of kind of standards and testing uh, that we kind of think of today. But but uh, yeah, so that's sort of able to answer your question. You had a question. Yeah, uh, industries bring up where there are natural resources of right. clay, but you also need the workers. So did the workers come from New York City? And was there a difference between the workers in the brickyard? And then was there a lot of bricklayers nearby as well? And did they ever interact? Mm -hmm. A good question. And one that I wish I was better equipped to answer. Partly answer that. Yeah, yeah go ahead. I, I know a lot of Italians were actually brought straight from Ellis Island, never set foot in New York City or Brooklyn. They literally brought them up the river to work in the brickyards. Um, you know, there were gang bosses that met the ships coming from Italy. And mm -hmm. I think it's safe to, to say it was an industry that, that was staffed largely yeah. by recent immigrants. Yeah. Um, African Americans from the South too, and it was uh, probably an industry that had a lot to do with, you know, the diversification demographically of the Hudson Valley, yeah. uh, historically. Yeah. Wasn't this area populated by the people who were the group builders, and then they took down the whole neighborhood, and they called it urban renewal right here? Oh, this yeah. where where we are now. The whole other yeah. 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 The yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, ooh, so many questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where do they make bricks now? Where Bangladesh, <laughs> India, Pakistan. Um, I found a couple in Ohio a few years ago that were still making brick. They wouldn't let me into the property, but I was able to drive around it. They were still active. I think there may be a couple in Pennsylvania. There's a a limited number of large brickmakers left, at least in the east half of the United States today, uh, whereas before it was every couple of miles another brickyard or even more, uh, you know, clustered than that, um, which is a problem for sourcing brick, I can tell you. <laughs> and a lot of these brick companies now will only sell you 50,000 at a time, too. So if you have a, if you're, say, restoring a historic building and you only need a couple yeah. thousand, you, it's difficult. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Where, where can we find what your father wrote? Doesn't ring a bell. Sounds like we should, but wait, do you know what it's called? Ah, oh, okay. I'd love to see it. How did you two meet? We met oh. in uh, April first, nineteen ninety-nine. That's a whole nother lecture. Yeah, <laughs> ben, 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 Bannerman's Bannerman's. Yeah, uh, um, I had access on April Fool's Day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for coming. Oh, you said O'Connor. Richard. Richard. It rings okay. a bell. Richard P. O'Connor, University of Pennsylvania. We're going to have to come back to the YouTube video when we inevitably yeah. forget that. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah. So the color of brick, is it the pure firing of the clay? Period. The, co the red color of the brick, is yeah. it the pure firing of the clay? Is it the clay? It's it's the clay, but it's it's clay, it's uh, iron, gas. isn't it? Like iron inclusions in the clay that yeah. it, that turn it red. Yeah, Fred, did, you can answer that better. The clay that gives it the red color when fired. Yeah, when you fire it. Yeah. And so that's that's within it's inherent within the clay. Yeah, yeah. Iron. yeah. And in some cases, they add color like ochre to it, or yeah. something that they did to give the. Bricks maybe a pinch or something like that. Or you'll find what's called iron spot brick, where little bits of yeah, flakes of iron were mixed into the clay. And then they would burn into black little specks in the in the brick. Yeah. There, there are lots of different types of clays. The lattices vary them. The elements that are in them vary. Uh, have you ever seen a geologic map of the clay deposits in the Hudson Valley? Probably, yeah. Okay. 
Is it do you, you're asking does such well, a thing exist or know, like uh, you know the New York State Museum might have done something mm -hmm. like that at some at one time or another. To that point, uh, this fellow, Dr. Gilbert, he had this uh, project. I don't know how far he got with it, but his idea was to sample a lot of clay from the bricks. Okay, I got oh. to drill a little out of something, then analyze mm -hmm. the powder. And uh, from that, he would establish some sort of a table or, or something, a listing or something like that based on the content, the chemical content. And from there, you, you should be able having known what bricks, what a brick means that the, the powder came from, you could probably tell, or you should be able to tell where the brick was made. You know, in case you find bricks, there's no name on them. You know, people want to know well, who made it or what and all that sort of thing. You know? So it's, oh, I, just, yeah, right. uh, I just finished a book on the history of Bannerman's, or, I'm sorry, um, Denny's Point. Point. Yes, yeah. And that There's has a, book, a lot of information about the brickworks there, and, uh, but talks a lot, some about the sociological aspects, who the workers were, where they came from. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's a good book. Yes, there's, there's more and more literature all the time, and it, it's a, a subject, there's so many angles, you know, to be an expert in it. And the, re the real experts are the people who work there, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the people who ran these companies, and there were associations of the manufacturers and, and so forth. And Rob and I are just kind of admirers of, yes. of these places. Yes, but um, I have a feeling it's probably time to wrap up. Um, but th th thank you again. Thank you. And uh, we'll stick around for questions and quick standing and more Thank you again.